So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us um, for today's Raw Compliance webinar on modern day slavery. We are absolutely honored this morning. And can you can everybody hear me OK? If, if you can, just a thumbs up in the chat room would be great, just so I can make sure that we're, we're, we're everybody's audible and we can hear us. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Rajpal. Um, so in today's session, we have the absolute privilege and honor of having two esteemed guests coming to speak to us with regards to human trafficking and modern day slavery. And if I'm honest with all of you, um, and potentially some of you are in the same boat, I didn't actually think about that there was a difference between modern day slavery and human trafficking until the awareness was brought to me by Archanra and Kareen. So today's speaker, we have Archanra Kotecha, who is the founder and CEO of The Remedy Project. Um, for a number of years now, Archanra has been very active in the industry, giving legal advice and legal remedies to people who have been trapped within enslavement mm -hmm. and helping them move forward. Um, and also as well, Kareen um, Moreno-Taxman, who's the assistant um, attorney from the US Department of Justice, um, been involved in numerous enforcement actions with regards to human trafficking. These two individuals, without saying it lightly, save lives and they make a difference every single day to people's lives. And it makes me quite emotional because it's not an honour to speak with both of them. But if I, if you don't mind, um, our channel, if I first to you, would you mind just, I know I've introduced you, but would you mind just speaking a little bit about the Remedy Project and what you guys are doing? Sure. So, you know, I should perhaps start by saying that the Remedy Project is, is five days old and um, I was previously at Liberty Shared as their Asia Region Director and Head of Legal. And at Liberty Shared, I was involved in doing a lot of casework, but also a lot of policy work, working with governments, advising them on legal frameworks, how to frame the law. Uh, perhaps in, in Hong Kong and also regionally, um, I was also known for doing a lot of training with banks and financial institutions, particularly on looking at the nexus between human trafficking and money laundering. Uh, Liberty Shed was most certainly one of the pioneering NGOs that really started to look at, you know, following the money and, and sort of creating accountability for money flows relating to human trafficking. The Remedy Project is, is my latest endeavor, and it really is a focus on looking at justice solutions, particularly within the context of global supply chains and for migrant workers. I think one of the, the themes we want to explore, which is also connected with, with today's topic, is how can banks and financial institutions um, help by using their leverage um, in ensuring that you know, businesses where, that, are, that carry very heavy taints of slavery um, are actually leaned upon from a corporate governance perspective in order to bring about the change that can really change the ecosystem of work for, for thousands and millions of migrant workers across the world. So thank you for having me, Una. It's a pleasure to be here. You are on mute, Una. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Archana. Um, Karine also has joined us today, as I've mentioned. Um, Karine is actually dialing in from the US. So this is incredibly late in the evening for her. So firstly, Karine, thank you for that. Um, but also, could we possibly ask you to speak a few words about the amazing work that you've been doing also? Well, good evening from my point of view. I think it's good morning for most of you. Having worked in Malaysia for two years, I'm pretty used to this, uh, having different time zones and figuring the world out. I am a federal prosecutor, so that means that I work on uh, large criminal cases and uh, I find organizations that are involved in serious crime. And as part of that, I also do rule of law training throughout the world. And so I have been asked to do rule of law training in Brazil for two years, in Mexico for two years, two and a half years, uh, Malaysia most recently for two and a half years. And what I really try to do is work with the private sector and the public sector and law enforcement, try to figure out how we can best attack uh, different crimes, especially human trafficking. So I came to human trafficking a little differently than I think most people. I was a prosecutor who just basically went after big bad people, dope dealers, drug organizations, racketeering kinds of cases. And uh, I really didn't know what human trafficking was. And it's only through my international work that I first learned about it. And now I have prosecuted many, many of those cases as well as trained many people on it. 
And very much, Sarah, thank you very much, Karina. One of the things that you were you were talking about um, to us yesterday in particular was that in terms of training that you have been covering various sectors, um, the army, the, US, the hotel sector, and also banks as well. Yes, yes. The truth is human trafficking is not a crime that can be dealt with by law enforcement only. It really requires the community to have its ears and eyes out and you can't even see it unless you know what it looks like. And I actually think that people who are in the industry are very interested in knowing what it's about and that they really do want to not be complicit, unintentionally of course, but they don't want to be complicit with human trafficking. So they're usually interested in hearing about it. I hope that's how your audience feels today and I'm looking forward to talking to them. Wonderful. Well, thank you both very, very much. As I said, it's our absolute pleasure to have you both here today. And I really hope that this session is going to be a real awareness moment um, for everybody in the webinar um, on the fact that we can do something to make a change. Even a small change will make a difference. So today we're going to be discussing what is human trafficking and modern slavery and what is the difference between them. Again, something that I wasn't familiar with. I'm going to admit that. And um, what are the consequences? What are the banks doing to try and help? Uh, I wouldn't say eradicate, but at least identify the bad actors. Um, where are we getting it wrong and why? And lastly, uh, but most importantly, how can we make an active change to make a difference? So we do have a quick poll um, for everybody. And I'm not sure if you can see the poll on the screen. Um, I think my colleague, Jay. Is I can see it. You can see it, fantastic. Yeah. Have you, have you got the ability to make the, the to, to, to select the different choices? Let's see. Um, yeah, I, well, I can see what people are doing. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so basically the question is like, what is human trafficking? And these are actually some, you know, maybe if, I, if, if you don't mind, Kareem, maybe I could pass it to you first and foremost. One of the options obviously on this list is, is love and affection. And I think that's something which for me was a little bit of a surprise that we put this in a poll as a question about what is human trafficking, because it's not something we would think about in respect of human trafficking. But um, you know, with, within, within the poll itself, could you maybe just talk through a few of these areas? Sure, I'll start with love and affection because that is the strangest one. Um, people think that human trafficking involves people being stolen in the middle of the night, taken in chains, and made either to work or have sex. And that's really just not the way it works. Uh, human trafficking is really a civil rights type of crime. It's that what people do is they take away people's basic ability to decide what they want to do in their life. That's why if you look at any law in the world regarding human trafficking, consent is not a defense. In other words, you cannot consent to be trafficked. And the reason why you can't, be con you can't consent is because it is because of the force, fraud, and coercion, that's another key word there, that has been exerted upon you that makes you be trafficked. So one of the tools of the coercion is love and affection. Traffickers will look for people who are very, time, very often poor, homeless, have problems, have issues, and who are looking for someone to say, I can take care of you, I will take care of you. So, and sometimes, especially in sex trafficking, there is a real bond that happens between the victims and their trafficker. Perfect. So that if you go to um, forced labor, forced labor is, some people think, well, you know, forced labor means you don't get paid the right amount, or forced labor means that you don't get off when you have a religious holiday. Well, that's not forced labor in a human trafficking sense because um, at least I have had bad bosses and I'm sure many of you either have had bad bosses or are bad bosses in your employees' minds. And that's not forced labor. Forced labor is when the person is unable to um, say no whether it's because they've been coerced or because there's debt bondage, that is where they have a huge amount of debt that they believe they owe their trafficker. And if they don't pay it, that something will happen to them or to their family. 
and uh, they also have the inability to have their own money. So those are uh, some of the ways. Now, force, fraud, and coercion, I think we'll talk a little bit more about later, but uh, that's generally the idea. Don't think of it as people who are having sex or people who are made to work. It's really people who have been forced um, through actual physical force or by fraudulent promises or have been coerced to do things that no human being would do. Thank you. I mean, Go ahead, Stachana. Well, I know I was just going to jump in and say that, you know, one of the major confusions people have, and this is, you know, largely to be blamed on, on you know, uh, an emerging advocacy movement around modern day slavery, is the confusion between human trafficking, modern day slavery and forced labor. Um, this is, this can be quite problematic when it comes to framing cases in particular, because different countries have different legal frameworks. Some countries make a clear distinction between forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation. They're treated differently in the law. And therefore, you know, the framing of the case needs to be different. And sometimes the, the, the sort of the symptoms and indicators present themselves in different ways. And just to demystify, modern day slavery is not really a term defined in the law anywhere. It has been described in the UK Modern, Modern Slavery Act as representing a series of offenses, including human trafficking, including forced labor, including forced marriage and various others as well. So essentially a spectrum of exploitative activities that are described for convenience sake as modern day slavery. And also when, when advocates were, would talk about human trafficking, the response to slavery was almost instant as compared to trafficking, which needed to be explained. So, you know, that emerged as the dominant narrative and also it became the narrative adopted by the private sector as well. So it's very common to hear the private sector use modern day slavery as opposed to human trafficking. But, you know, it essentially is an umbrella term for different forms of exploitation. And, and, thank right. and if you really want to know why it is that we are all, every country in the world is interested in human trafficking. One of the main reasons is because the United Nations, um, all, of our, all of us countries that are signatories, we signed the Palermo Agreement that said, we will fight human trafficking. Not only are we against it, but we will take certain steps, including developing laws, developing task forces, uh, protecting victims, all those things were agreed upon by the international community, by our countries. And so that's where it starts. And then every country also agreed to pass a human, an anti-human trafficking law. So all the things that every country has done and the reason why we all kind of woke up to it was really because of what started with the UN and uh, the treaties. Thank you very much, Karina. And I have to say, and again, this was my ignorance, uh, with, with obviously with changes in, in naming conventions, I'd actually thought that modern day slavery was just a new way of talking about human trafficking. And it was only through discussions with both of you that I realized that I was mistaken. So um, if, if you don't mind, our, our Chana, obviously we're, we've got to sit here on what is human trafficking and we'll talk about the difference between human trafficking and modern day slavery. But would you mind kind of just explaining again for the purposes of the, of the, the, the audience what the actual difference is between the two? Yeah, I mean, you know, I wouldn't get too hung up about it, except for the fact that human trafficking is very clearly defined. Corinne just referred uh, a moment ago to the UN's Palermo Protocol. So we have a definition of human trafficking, which is essentially built around three pillars. One, which represents actions that are taken very deliberately to recruit individuals, to transport them, to harbor them, etc. Um, for the using force, fraud or coercion and for the purposes of exploitation. The exploitation takes many different forms. It could be in, in the context of forced marriage. It could be sexual exploitation. It could be labor exploitation. But the essence of, of trafficking really is force, fraud, coercion and the sort of, you know, the exploitation um, of the individual. So some countries have said, you know, movement is not essential. Others have kept the requirement of movement as fairly central. Now, when it comes to, to modern day slavery, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's an umbrella term. It represents many offenses that um, include human trafficking, but also overlap. For example, forced labor on its own, uh, debt bondage, um, you know, domestic servitude, etc. 
all of these exist on the same spectrum, but sort of to varying degrees and represent slightly overlapping, but also different offenses. And, um, you know, therefore, you know, modern slavery, if, if one would think about it, is, is really essentially a representation of a series of types of exploitation, which includes human trafficking. Human trafficking and forced labor have very clearly defined definitions and are very clearly articulated, not just in international laws, but also within domestic laws of, of most countries as well. Um, we've seen in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, a real sort of emergence of the need to distinguish between forced labor and human trafficking, because many cases of forced labor that were being run as human trafficking cases were failing because they couldn't meet the threshold. So there is, there is a, a distinction to be made there, which, which is an important one. But essentially, the essence of that cuts across all of these is the use of fraud, coercion and force, but also the exploitation which is at the heart of, of all of these offenses. And if you look at the numbers that you've, you've put up, 40.3 million people uh, estimated to be in modern day slavery around the world, with 24.9 million of these individuals being in conditions of forced labor. So that would include, for example, people in sweatshops, uh, garment factories, in agriculture, in fisheries, uh, domestic servitude, et cetera, et cetera. And can I ask, when we talk about forced labour, you know, this is something that is, is incredibly interesting as well. You know, when we look at for, forced labour, again, there's this, this image that would naturally come to, to many of us of, you know, people, you know, in, in, you know, in very difficult circumstances. Um, we talked earlier about, you know, the, the, the media image of chains and, uh, you know, bondage. But, but forced labour actually exists all around us. And could you maybe talk about some of the types of forced labour that, that you've dealt with and that you've been seeing, um, especially across South, Southeast Asia? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting one. And this is where a lot of banks and financial institutions come unstuck. Because looking at sex trafficking or looking at online child sexual exploitation are almost the immediate go-tos when it comes to financial crime and looking for you know, money that comes from trafficking. The harder part is actually looking at very large big ticket accounts where you know these industries are actually uh, linked to slavery. Examples being rubber, palm oil, fisheries, uh, garment, the apparel industry, footwear. And there, therein is the difficulty. And when one looks at these business models, these business models are built on the normalization of exploitation. What do I mean by that? Um, the workers in these sectors are often migrant workers who pay very large recruitment fees in order to get jobs in, in destination countries. When they arrive there, often passports are taken away. Often the working and living uh, and earning conditions are very different to what they have been promised. There is a lot of wage theft, a lot of wage deduction and contract substitution. Very common. And, and you know, it, it almost is a way of doing business, which is very normal because everybody does this and this is how to remain competitive and profitable. However, you know, having had this over a series of years and because the supply chains are so complex, it's not tier one, tier two, it's really deep. Um, and a lot of the problems are located very further down the supply chain. So sort of, you know, um, with smaller and medium sized enterprises there's been this sort of dissociation with problems that happen further down the supply chains. And this has led to really entrenching sort of um, a lot of these, these exploitation issues. So, you know, it is more common and it is a lot more deeply entrenched in global supply chains than, you know, one, one would ever think. And when you think about the fact that human trafficking and forced labor are predicate offenses across most countries in the world, particularly those who've adopted the Palermo Protocol as well. Um, it's quite surprising that this continues to exist. It is widely reported and talked about, but yet it isn't figuring as high on the radar as it should, uh, because this happens behind the guise or under the guise of legitimate business. These are legitimate business models. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of issues at the moment that are very widely reported across rubber, across agriculture, across fisheries. And of course, with COVID, um, it has brought a whole new dimension um, to the inequalities and a lot of the injustices suffered by migrant workers in, in supply chains. 
Thank you, Arshana. And, and Corinne, you mentioned obviously you were working in Malaysia for two years and obviously with things such as the Sarawak report, we have seen, you know, obviously the rainforest deconstruction that has been happening across Malaysia for the palm oil sector, which Arshana referred to. Um, obviously, you, you've dealt with many cases, some of which I'm sure you can't speak of, um, you know, openly. But what has been your experience in this area through the work that you've been doing? So I'm just going to give an example that is not a Malaysia example, because that's probably better. Uh, I'm going to talk about an example that happens in the, happens in the United States, okay? Because most people think that the United States tells everyone they shouldn't have uh, forced labor and that we think we have it solved, and we do not. I mean, that is something that um, I really want to disabuse you of that idea. So this is what happens, and let me give you an example. In the United States, sometimes the farmers need uh, extra help during the seasons. And so the United States government allows migrants to legally come to the United States in order to have them work on a certain industry. And in order to do that job, the employer has to show that no one else can do the job, can agree, has to agree to certain work conditions, and has to also um, agree to pay a certain fee. And the fee differs state to state, okay? So you take people in other countries and they don't know that they legally can just go and apply for a migrant visa. They are told by their recruiters that you, I will get you in, but you have to pay me $1,000 or you have to pay me $5,000 and then I will put you on the list. Now, there's no such list, okay? Any person in, let's say, Mexico can just go and apply to be a migrant worker anywhere they want, but that's not what they're told. Yeah. So you get your name on the list, and then once you're on the list, for you to pay that $1,000 or $5,000, whatever that amount is, your whole family has gone into debt. They have, uh, most Mexican families, if they have a postage stamp, size property that the whole family owns, they will give the deed of that piece of land to the recruiter. So when they come to the United States, they have the money of their whole village, friends, family backing them up. So they can't leave. The ties are not just from their traffickers, but it is their traffickers. It's also because there's been such an investment in money. And then when they come to the United States, they're put in places where they don't know anyone, they don't, can't speak the language, they can't move around freely, their passports are taken, and they are, though, allowed to go and send money home once every two weeks or once a month. And that's the part that people don't understand. Well, for the, for the employer, if he doesn't let that employee send money home, he knows that someone will complain. So they will send money home. And so you will see bank transfers. And that's one of my first investigative tools. I go and see where the farmers are taking the workers to pay to deposit their checks. And, um, and so you will see small deposits, right? Because they're paid very little, but it'll all be on one day. So, um, so that's how it starts. It's the indebtedness, which is the fraud. You could only get this job. That's the fraud. If you pay me this way, I can put you on the list. Then once you get there, the coercion is, I won't give back the property to your family. I won't give back this to anyone because you promised to work. If you don't fill your contract, you lose everything. And then sometimes there's also the force. Um, oftentimes they'll deny them water, deny them medical care, and they can't really say no. So that's why it's forced labor. And that's actually I mean, Una, sorry, one, one of the things that I really wanted to, to bring out, you know, following uh, Corinne's intervention is, is very much the fact that I don't think many people appreciate what the stigma is of being a failed migrant. What I mean by that is what happens when you go home a victim and you are unable to take money back home with you or you haven't earned that money. And that's one of the significant factors in people not seeking out help. 
yeah. because essentially they've got their money tied up. They are heavily indebted. Their passports might not be with them. So the implications of actually walking away are so substantial for many people and for their families and for their communities that they choose to remain in these situations of abuse because there is no other alternative for them. And, you know, I only became familiar with this dimension of stigma, of going home, not having earned the money to buy a plot of land, to educate your children or to give your family a better life as compared to the many others who did. And this is also part of the normalization of exploitation experience where if every other migrant is doing it and is suffering it, then I should, why should I speak up? Yeah. So that is something that, you know, that isn't always apparent or understood, but it is a very, very important dimension in understanding why people end up and stay in these situations. And one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to understand is a lot of these migrant workers will not have bank accounts of their own. And in, in previous times, they would have most likely used services such as Western Union to transfer money back and not, not picking out anyone individually. But now that we have much more fintech options, and for example, in Asia, we have WeChat, you can send money via various, um, you know, various communication tools. Does that make it more challenging to be able to track and understand where the monies are going to? I mean, what we've, what we've seen um, in, you know, in, in our part of the world is, is most certainly that the lack of digitization of payments. So most people don't have bank accounts. If you imagine a palm oil plantation, which is super remote, someone being paid their wages. I mean, you know, even where there are wage deductions, it becomes very difficult to account for these because there is no track and there is no footprint as such. Um, the books are often cooked and, you know, it's very hard to work out who was paid when, what, how much, what were the deductions for, etc. And given the sort of often, you know, the difference in language, the difference in culture and um, the position, the vulnerable position of migrant workers, they also don't have access to the right level of information um, in order to understand fully what is going on with, with the pay. Um, we, we've seen the emergence, certainly, of a lot of informal remittance services that uh, migrant workers use to send money home. And that has certainly complicated things. One of the recommendations of um, FATF was that there should be a requirement for these to be registered and to have sort of the requirement to actually um, keep records of transactions so that, you know, it would allow for you know, investigation purposes, for evidence, and to create a certain footprint. There are a lot of issues, particularly when you look at, for example, um, cash-based economies and tracing uh, the money back there. And you know, we see, for example, the widespread use of cash for many transactions. We see small businesses being used, for example, takeaway shops or et cetera, to wash money through them. Um, we also see very, very small amounts in remittances being sent home by victims or the use of multiple accounts, et cetera, where, you know, that is a possibility available. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is complicated and there is a need to create a stronger and a, and a better footprint um, around a lot of these informal remittance services. And, you know, one of the fines uh, recently given out to, to Western Union um, a few years back, I'm sure Corinne will talk about that at some point, by the US government, um, also indicates that there are very easy ways of getting around even the formal banking system as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think one of the things that people don't realize is even if you are doing a completely illegal uh, forced labor situation, you have to keep a set of books because you still do have to pay something to the to the people. It's not going to be their fair wage. It's not going to be what they expect. And so invariably, there are two sets of books. There's the books that they will show when the government comes or when somebody wants to inspect the business or whatever else. But then there's always the second set of books too, because people do still want an accounting. You know, I was supposed to send back $5 where, you know, where did you didn't give them to me this week. So uh, so that's another thing that we look for is two sets of books, the legitimate books that are really not, they're fraudulent. And then, the, but they do keep books about how much they're paying and who they're paying. And uh, even in the world of forced labor, 
the supervisors make more than uh, the grunt workers. And so all those things, they, you know, they still have those kind of hierarchies. So if you ask people how much they make, it will be a very different answer than what their books show, the, the books that they would present, their employer would present to uh, a police officer or to some regulator. I mean, one of, one of the complications we've seen in practice is that, for example, in countries like Malaysia, where you have outsourcing agents, so these are essentially brokers who sit between the, the, the employer and the migrant worker, and they take a fee to manage basically the employment relationship and the recruitment process for the employer. Um, and, and they often, that's where some of the deductions are made illegally. And it's further complicated by the fact that the accounting practice of the ultimate employer will not necessarily pick up the irregularities that are happening at broker level, which actually affect the migrant worker quite severely. So Malaysia at the moment putting in place uh, laws to try and outphase the existence of, of outsourcing agencies, you know, sort of as, as a middle layer, because that definitely does mess up the accounting and creates opportunities for exploitation as well. And that was actually something really interesting I, I want to talk again. A number of our participants today are from obviously the financial industry sector. And one of the things obviously on the screen, we're talking about industry risk um, and the different, the different kind of commodity businesses that are, are impacted. But as you just rightly said there, Archana, there's a lot of agents involved here who wouldn't necessarily identify with the respective industries. So, you know, is that something as well that you see as a challenge or have you seen any ways in which we can better identify these typologies? I mean, it depends, right? It depends on the industry and the level of sophistication of the brokers. If you look at fishing, for example, there are what are called manning agencies and the manning agencies are essentially very large uh, enterprises that actually you know, are, are located in, in many sort of um, financial centers in Southeast Asia. And they recruit crew for boats across many different Southeast Asian jurisdictions. The, fun, the footprint there is very firm and these companies are well known. So, you know, when you, when you look at from that perspective, there isn't much difficulty. Um, but when you look at smaller brokers and where the footprint might not be so strong, then it's a little bit more problematic. I think it might be interesting to look at, uh, to watch the video, Una, because it actually really sets out in, in great detail what the problem looks like on the ground and how financial um, institutions can address these. Perfect. Can you I just want to say that one of the things, though, that we do see is that the brokers are specialized. And most of them, the traffickers usually traffic people from their own. So you're gonna, if you have Filipinos being trafficked, their trafficker will be Filipino as well. Uh, in, in almost every single investigation I have done, except for American Indians who are trafficked, it's always the same uh, ethnic group, same background. And that's because that person knows the cultural mores, they know how to press buttons, they understand the value system, and they can manipulate. Plus, they probably have the language issue. So they're not going to look like different. They're going to look just like one of them. Um, and, and so that also gets very confusing because it seems like they're all working together when really the trafficker is not. Absolutely. And so I'm just going to then show this video here that was very kindly shared with us. Um, and again, this will explain about the usage of agents and other parties as well and how th that, that can make the identification um, of, of the perpetrators even more challenging. Well, is there a way to get rid of the, 40 million victims? The a $150 billion industry. This is modern day slavery. Most of the proceeds from this $150 billion industry flow through financial services. Under global anti-money laundering laws and regulations, financial institutions should identify and report suspicious activity associated with proceeds from human trafficking, including direct banking relationships, indirect banking relationships, correspondent banking relationships, and U.S. dollar clearing. 
But specifically, where is the risk? What jurisdictions? What industries? Potentially every country in the world has exposure to human trafficking and slavery risk in industries with many workers and little regulation, including agriculture and fishing, domestic work, construction, extractives, oil and mining, prostitution, and sexual exploitation. Let's look at the fishing industry, which spans many geographic regions. If a Southeast Asian-based fishery decides it wants to charter vessels to fish in New Zealand waters, it will first contact a financial institution for funding. Once the bank agrees, that money is used to contract a local New Zealand corporate to charter fishing vessels. If forced labor is later proved, this is where culpability gets complicated. While the local Southeast Asian-based corporate owns the boats and provides both funding and crew, New Zealand corporates are also accountable because they hold the charter agreement. They also agreed to the partnership in the first place. Once the charter agreement is in place, the Southeast Asian-based company must find a way to supply crew for its vessels. Usually this occurs through a local manning agent in a country where recruitment is easy and people are desperate to find work. In this hypothetical case, men were recruited by Filipino, Indonesian, and Taiwanese recruiting agencies to work on the Southeast Asian-based company's fishing vessels, traveling for work to New Zealand through major hubs like Singapore. Promised a well-paying job with money that will provide for their families, the men sign multiple contracts many times in languages they do not understand. Recruiters provide the men with fake or forged visas. You must pay me for your work papers or hand over your property as collateral, the recruiter says as he takes money from the men, and then work off your debt if you cannot pay. Little do the men know what awaits them on board. Once at sea, the men are forced into working conditions that often result in bodily injury and are made to work long hours with little to no sleep. With no medical care, the men are left to suffer. Still others aren't allowed to even leave the boat, and with their passports taken by the recruiter or captain, leaving may result in their own arrest and deportation. The men receive nothing for their hard work, or if they do receive payment, it is far below what they were promised. If they try to return home, they are threatened or forced to pay up because they did not pay off their debt. Sometimes physically and mentally abused, they experience further problems when they try to return home. Though the men do not receive payment, the companies involved still generate revenue from the fish caught on these slave-manned vessels. In this hypothetical case, the catch is processed and distributed by the New Zealand company into supermarkets and the supply chain worldwide, leading to further risk for banks who may do business with larger companies in the supply chain. The Southeast Asian-based company then receives money generated from the fish caught on these vessels. The payment is often in U.S. dollars, the predominant currency of trade, leading to further risk for banks. Singapore, New Zealand, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, the U.K., the U.S. All jurisdictions that played a role in this case of modern-day slavery. Funding requests, payment, revenue, are all areas of risk. Hundreds of men suffering horrific abuses on board ships, fishing for hours at a time and supplying fish into supermarkets worldwide. The import of fish caught by slaves into the UK and US may be a breach of the UK's Modern Slavery Act, the UK Criminal Finances Act of 2017, the US's California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, and the U.S. Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act of 2015. How can we combat this $150 billion crime? Running adverse media checks, filing suspicious transaction reports, and not doing business with those who profit from slavery. This is how to disrupt the environment in which slavery thrives. As William Wilberforce once said about slavery, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know.
thank you also to, to our channel and Liberty Shared for, for sharing that video with us. It, it really is a phenomenal video. And actually, one of the things I was really conscious about when I lived in Singapore was every day, you know, we would have patrol boats patrolling a lot of the ships that were waiting to come into port in Singapore. And I remember asking, you know, what was it for? Were they checking, you know, for documentation, et cetera? And one of the responses was no, it's actually to stop and identify people from swimming ashore. Um, and then they were talking as well about the workers on board the ships who had been working in absolutely horrendous and horrific conditions. And obviously the closer they get to shore, especially Singapore, it was very close to be able to swim ashore. So, you know, it was something that really, I was naive about and I didn't realize that this really was happening uh, and we you know we see cargo vessels but we don't really understand the, the true nature of what's happening in the background. We've been getting some really amazing questions in the chat room um, both before and during the video so if you don't mind I know that we're going to talk about some of this stuff later on but as the questions are coming in and obviously to generate more discussion a question from Mike Coates um, what can institutions do to address the problem what can we do individually and should governments be standing up? Um, so maybe Corrine, firstly to yourself, obviously from a government perspective, you know, you guys are doing a hell of a lot of work over at the US Department of Justice, but um, you know, what other work could governments be doing? And in particular, public-private partnerships, do they help um, and are they encouraged? Oh, Corrine, you're on mute, sorry. You're, you're doing an una. <laughs> I thought I was not going to do that. Okay. Um, the, at the end of the day, it is the private sector that plays a huge role in the ability to detect this. And that's because you're, in, you're having the firsthand contact with the workers, the money people, and everybody else. You're the ones who can see it. Uh, we can only try to find it afterwards. And so I think that um, I'll give you a, a non-human trafficking example. I worked for a while in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. That's that secret court in the United States where we go and find you know, the, the, the worst, worst terrorist threats to the United States. And when I got there, I thought that all I would be seeing would be these amazing surveillance techniques and all this law enforcement um, hidden cameras, et cetera. Not true. Almost every case I worked on, it was some citizen who noticed something, some business who noticed something. And they're the ones who got, who noticed that something wasn't right. And so what can you do? The first thing you can do is go back to your industry and talk to your workers and tell them, ask them what they think the indicators are. Uh, many times they know it's just never been uh, aired or put out there for others to know it. Um, I do this all the time with the hotel industry. Every hotel can come up with, their employees can give you the whole list of what the indicators will be. You just have to ask them. I think you'll see the same thing if you're in banking. You'll see how the bank employees, uh, how people come and deposit money. They'll know, you just have to ask. Yep. And um, one of the things that maybe our, our channel, I know that you've done a lot of work around this question from Jackal um, is what kind of red flags um, should financial institutions be focusing on? Like, is there anything specific uh, that people could take away today and look at immediately? Um, is there any, any advice in this area that you could provide? Oh, so I think, you know, just to take a step back from, from that, there are a few things that financial institutions can do very helpfully. One, starting with KIC and, and customer due diligence and, and taking, you know, much broader search terms that actually include modern day slavery terms, because now a lot of the data service providers have uh, data that specifically relates to individuals, organizations or assets involved in forced labor and human trafficking. So an expanded search term and a much, you know, sort of in-depth um, KYC. The second thing is to look at training um, staff. Uh, not, not simply in understanding what is human trafficking, but also in getting a lot more familiar with sector risk, industry risk, and, you know, what are the sort of the key red flags. The red flags, you know, everybody always asks when we do training, uh, what are the indicators? Can you tell us? Now, the thing about indicators is that there's, it's not a magic box. Essentially, a lot of the indicators for human trafficking are shared across many other offenses as well. So they don't necessarily point to human trafficking. 
there are certain specific indicators that are sort of more victim-based and focused on human trafficking, um, however. And these would include where, for example, the victim has interaction with the banking um, sector, for example, by being taken into a bank by a trafficker, et cetera. That doesn't happen in many cases, but it does happen. And that's something to watch out for. The indicators generally break down into sort of, you know, customer focused indicators and transaction focused indicators. Again, a lot of these are set out in resources such as, you know, at the FATF document of July 2018, which has a lot of very useful typologies on the different forms of trafficking um, and slavery that affect different sectors and different jurisdictions. I would really recommend people take a flick through that. You know, maybe we can circulate a list of resources after to all the attendees. There's, of course, FinCEN guidance that was put out in 2014, and again, re more recently in October 2020. Um, and there's also the Financial Sector Commission uh, report, which is quite a, a large report that sort of summarizes a lot of the resources that are out there. But essentially, this is not, you know, it's, it's not really, there's no quick answer to this. Um, different banks are experimenting with different approaches, building typologies, doing network analysis, is becoming very critical. So some banks in Europe have started to mine these, their own SAR database in order to start doing this network analysis. And it has worked very positively in the favor of some. Um, but this isn't being done quite as widely as one would expect. And of course, you know, there are a lot of false positives, which, which doesn't help. And oftentimes the typologies are too high level. Yep. Um, when I was at Liberty Shared, one of the, the key offerings of Liberty Shared was to build these typologies because we had access to data from the ground and we were able to really paint a picture of how people were being moved, how goods were being produced, where they were going and who was involved. And essentially, the typology building is, is also a very important part of understanding what the reality looks like. And I guess this highlights one of the key problems in that the data sets that currently exist are not always re reflective of the nuances of what the problem looks like on the front line. And you know, you mentioned public and private partnerships earlier. Um, the, the sort of, you know, the, the NGO world that is often front facing to uh, victims and is the first sort of point of debrief for victims where a lot of the evidence is gathered. Um, are often not a formal part of these public-private partnerships. They don't really have a seat at the table. So very often the bridge to move information and data from the front line to the front desk of a bank just doesn't exist and is broken down. So, you know, if, if banks really want to be taking this seriously, um, you know, they can do anything from the enhanced KYC, the transaction monitoring, um, the building of the typologies, mining the SARS, and perhaps creating a, a more pointed uh, way of filing um, SARS. Like, you know, in the latest FinCEN report, they asked that when banks are completing SARS, they very specifically tick the human trafficking box. Hong Kong also has such a box. And that they very clearly put down that, you know, which aspects of the advisory that FinCEN put out in October is reflected in their SAR narrative. And the idea really is to start creating a data set that is a lot more targeted and pointed so that if you are going to mine it, um, you would get a much more accurate representation. There's been a lot of conversation around, and, and also it's a growing trend, that uh, banks are exiting clients that come from you know, forced labor and human trafficking heavy sectors, HSBC, palm oil, um, you know, and rubber banks, Standard Chartered, various others, you know, exited some clients recently. My view on that is, is very much that, you know, if we have these large international um, banks who are exiting these businesses, we don't have much hope for bringing change in the way these businesses operate. And this is an opportunity for banks to use their leverage and to lean on their clients in order to help clean up some of these practices um, on the ground, because otherwise, you know, a, a, a smaller local or regional bank that is perhaps not um, as mindful of a lot of these issues picks up the business and the opportunities for making change are lost. Yeah. And I think one of the, one of the questions to... was, was, sorry, sorry, Karine, just one of the questions there that, that you mentioned 
Um, Alex Bowen had asked in the chat room about, you know, is there data sets that FIs could use to mine and cross-reference? And I think what's, what's important that you mentioned there, Archana, is there are um, entities out there that can help banks to, to develop these typologies. The typologies that we currently use are far too high level. They're scenario-based, they're threshold-based, they're rule-based. Um, and we need to have specific typologies to identify these behaviours. So organisations that you mentioned, such as Liberty Cha Shared and the Remedy Project, can actually help to implement and work with banks to identify those typologies for their transaction monitoring systems. And, you know, just to, just to tell you very quickly something that a bank has done, which, has, which is working well, is ABN AMRO, um, you know, took a, a very unusual step recently to actually go to... Um, the diamond mines, where a lot of their diamond dealer clients buy the diamonds from. And they did their own supply chain analysis of where the risks were, et cetera. These were then filtered into an algorithm that would all of the transactions would run through. And that was a way of experimenting with whether you know, the bank doing its own supply chain analysis and building its own algorithm would, would be able to uh, determine in a much better way and more targeted way where the risks were with what transactions and then obviously put it through human scrutiny to deal with. Um, I understand that it seems to be working quite well, but again, you know, this is a very focused approach and not one that is common across uh, banks or sectors. And, and apologies, Karine, I interrupted you there. Okay. Uh, I was going to say that I would be remiss if I didn't tell you what a good job banks are doing with SARS. I actually read your SARS, okay? And uh, you're the person I, that gets them. We've been looking for this person all these years. Well, that's what I spent the whole day today doing. Uh, so, what I'm so impressed with how much information there are in the SARS reports and how detailed they are, and what a great job your employees are doing. Um, I would try to figure out some reward mechanism, maybe give the person who does the most SARS a reward or a bonus, um, because it's such a tension of should I be doing this or should I not be doing this, really want me to do this. And, uh, but I can tell you that we really rely on your SARS. I read them all the time. We even have committees that work together in law enforcement where we go through SARS on a routine basis to identify industries, identify different. Uh, unfortunately, that message never gets back to you. Um, and so I really wanted to take the opportunity to tell you that your work does pay off. And because of all the SARS secrecy, it's very hard for us to report back to you that you were the key, your bank, your employee, opening up all this evidence for us. So I wanna thank you for all the prosecutors and law enforcement in the world, let you know we really do use them and they're very well done. Thank you. Una, can I just pipe in very quickly? I mean, it would be remiss of me not to highlight some of the problems that exist with filing SARS in our, in our part of the world. And you know, that essentially is, you know, in, in some countries in Southeast Asia, the capacity of analysts or the team that is sort of reviewing and investigating the SARS is very small for the entire nation. And that really affects the number of SARS that are actually got through, investigated, and that see the light of day. It's the resource issue is a real issue. The second big issue, going back to a question Mike uh, Coates raised earlier, is really about uh, national regulator priority. Uh, FinCEN has made this a big priority. There have been advisories. This is always in the topic. This is much talked about. However, when you look at the region uh, you know, where, where I work, this is not really a key priority. We've seen some sporadic action in Thailand around this, particularly because of the focus on Thailand uh, in relation to the Rohingya case. But frankly, this is really not a national regulator priority. And therefore, we find that SARS that very specifically relate to human trafficking um, are not very high in number. And also one of the things that we don't really see is a disaggregation of data relating to SARS so that you actually know how many were filed in relation to human trafficking? How many were filed in relation to other offenses? It would really help to see that because I think that would also create a bit of pressure to really build up um, the, the SAR database around human trafficking and the knowledge and understanding. 
but we really need national regulators to step up a little bit and to make make this you know an important issue as well well i think well, and i think that one of the things that's really important to remember is that corruption usually goes hand in hand with human trafficking and uh so when you see a police officer or a customs worker or um, people who are in those kinds of positions with unusual wealth, that is very likely corruption. And that's one thing that nobody likes to talk about because it's harder to get to and it's harder to prove, but you're actually seeing those monies coming into bank accounts. And this whole crime is about money. So knowing where to look, so not just looking at the industry, not just looking at the employees, but look at your public servants that use your bank. Yeah, and uh, they, they are a big part of the problem. Yeah, I think that's something that's incredibly important to, to point out as well. It's something that I have seen over the years. Um, I, on this slide that we have here, this is from the UK and LexisNexis actually did a review um, and, also, and also BAE Systems. And apparently 40% of banks in the UK aren't confident in their ability to identify human trafficking signs. But what we've seen over the years is we've become so checklist approach to KYC to know your customer, both at onboarding and periodic review, that we forget to ask the common sense question of, does this make sense? You know, they tick all the boxes, they provided all the documentation, the passport is valid. You know, everything, everything is there that needs to be. We know where they work, they know what they do. But one of the, the biggest way to, for us to identify illicit activities is to ask the questions after all of those tick the box approaches um, in terms of documentation and questions have been answered is to look at it from an independent perspective and say, does this actually make sense? And that is where a lot of us are identifying these uh, bad characters at, at onboarding and during periodic review. It's wonderful to hear that somebody does read SARS. Uh, I have to say over the years, we call it the black, the black box. We don't, know where, we don't know where they go to. So finally, the US Department of Justice has admitted they read them and you've, got, you've not even read them. You have a committee that looks at them. So that, that's phenomenal. But um, our, on our Chandra's point as well about the sophistication of the FIUs, the financial investigation units across the region, this isn't just actually an APAC issue. We actually saw it recently in the Wirecard case where the German FIU weren't able to cope with the number of submissions and it actually overlooked a number of the Wirecard um, submissions that had come through on SARS. So there is a lot of work to be done within the FIUs. Um, you know, I have even been asked in training sessions by FIU officers, what should we be looking for? What are the red flags? And that's a bit of a concern to me because you have to mine that data to really understand and identify typologies. It's not as easy as just reading one by one. You have to look at the network and pull it all together. So it's great to hear they're being read. There are challenges, but definitely we're working on them. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious that we've, we're over by one minute. One of the one of the points, um, you know, Archana, that you talked about was obviously ESG um, and co corporate and social responsibility. I think that's an incredibly important point as well to talk about, especially with the participants that we have. So if you wouldn't mind, Archana, just mentioning, I know you talked about it earlier in a little bit of detail, but if you could just talk about that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll start with CSR very briefly. I mean, I have a real problem when people present the issue of human trafficking as one that needs to tug on people's heartstrings. Setting that aside for a moment, the most important thing about this from a bank's, from a bank's perspective and looking at this from a financial crime officer perspective is that this represents a serious legal, financial and reputational risk for the bank. It needs to be taken seriously. This is not something you're going to do out of the kindness of your heart. It's your job to do this. And it really is your job to expand your parameters and to really learn and expand your knowledge and view of it. Um, similarly, it upsets me deeply that, you know, you have very large businesses where you have a corporate social responsibility team of three people that is essentially responsible for this entire operations, uh, environmental and social and governance footprint. Uh, it makes no sense. This is an issue that affects every single business line in the company. It's something that should be weaved and threaded through the entire operations and not left to two individuals to look after. When it comes to ESG, I mean, we've seen the emergence of, of you know, awareness around ESG regimes. In particular, there's been a lot of shareholder and investor activism around ESG in the United States. And that is also trickling through Europe and through various other jurisdictions. 
We also have very strong mandatory human rights due diligence rules coming into force in Europe next year, 2021. Um, a lot of these are bringing to the fore what are companies or what are institutions doing in relation to the environmental, social and governance footprints. The social piece is lagging behind the environmental piece for sure. But there's a lot more focus around you know, how issues of forced labor, human trafficking, uh, labor rights are being dealt with under the S element. And as you know, the focus intensifies, the data sets, you know, there will be a demand for better quality data sets. And that will hopefully generate better bridges and more nuanced quality of data, which will actually be of benefit both from a financial crime perspective and also from an ESG perspective, because the, the sort of the cross points between human trafficking and the banking sector are extend to much beyond financial crime compliance. Brilliant, thank you. And Corrine, one of the things, obviously very conscious of time, I know we, we will run slightly. One of the things obviously that everybody will want to know is about how we can affect change and how we both individually and within our entities, within the organizations we work for can really make effective change. So if you wouldn't mind, Kareem, would you mind just sharing a, a few kind of you know, thoughts from your perspective on what we can do to help and to make a difference? First of all, training. That's the first thing. I mean, training is, is paramount because if you don't know about this crime, you can't see it. You know, they call it hidden in plain sight. I can tell you that I was a prosecutor for 20 years and it's only once I learned about human trafficking that I could go back and say, oh my God, that, vic that was a victim. That was a labor case. That was a this case. I didn't see it. You don't see it because it doesn't look like other crimes. With other crimes, you see someone with a gun. You see someone with drugs. With human trafficking, you see a man with a woman. You see an employer with an employee. Those are things that are very normal in our world. So what makes it different? And that's where the education is so important. And then rewarding employees who do notice. There's a huge fear of coming forward. Uh, I see this a lot in the hotel industry. Employees are afraid that if they say that someone, they've seen something in a room, that they will lose their job. So you have to, if, if you think this is something you're going to help with, then you really have to encourage your employees to come forward. I find it to be the most effective is bring someone from the outside who knows the area, who knows your industry, and who actually has your workers tell them what they see. Um, they know it better than anybody else, but it's really training. You cannot, this is not an intuitive crime. Nothing about it makes sense. Brilliant, thank you so much, Corrine. And Archandra, over to you, you're obviously conscious of time, but if you would mind just sharing a few thoughts. I know you've talked a lot about ESG, CSR, typologies. Is there any kind of final thoughts that you would share with our participants? I mean, you know, final thoughts, I have to say from the experience I had working with uh, banks and financial institutions across Hong Kong and across Southeast Asia, one of the most important things was finding champions within different institutions. And, you know, these people got engaged and involved because they were frankly appalled by human trafficking and the fact that, you know, there was an ability for them as professionals and individuals to do something about it. I'm forever grateful for all of those people, and they know who they are, who helped me get into these institutions and who really promoted the issue and championed for trainings, uh, multiple trainings in, in certain institutions, and also who worked with us towards um, you know, uh, our relationship, not just with international regulators, but also national regulators. So, you know, it is really important to, to do this work. It is really important to keep pushing, particularly where this is not a priority for regulators, because there is nothing right about this. I have seen firsthand the consequences of this, and this affects not just the people who are trafficked, their families and their communities, but it affects all of us as a society. And you know, it's an erosion of values, which is simply can't stand back and allow it to happen. And if you have the capacity to do something about it professionally and individually, then you should most certainly take it. 
Well, thank you very much. I think that there's a key um, from, from both of you, the key takeaways are training and awareness is critical, understanding what we're looking for, know what we're looking for, um, and obviously believing that we can make change happen. And it's not just a conversation that's happening in the boardroom, but being as affected and implemented into our day-to-day -day operations. So all of this is critical. I want to thank you both so much on behalf of Raw Compliance for attending today. It means so much to have people at your level of, of understanding and you know, industry exposure to talk to us. Um, as you mentioned, our channel would be wonderful if we could share a list of resources with the participants after today. So thank you for, thank you for offering that. <laughs> and I will, be, I will be following up with you. But again, thank you both so much. Thank you to our participants. And we will be sharing the slides um, and obviously all of the list of resources on our website following today's call. So thank you very much to everyone. Have a wonderful day and thank you for your participation and support.